Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I hope you do. I encourage you to open them to Revelation chapter 5. We continue our walk through the book of Revelation. Look at the whole chapter this morning, Revelation 5. As you're finding your place there, I want to welcome uh, Reach Church DeSoto with us this morning. They're joining us via live stream, and they've got a fall festival, a trunk or treat occurring tonight. Um, they got the whole downtown blocked off, so the street will be blocked off, and they'll be conducting kind of a fall festival out there. So if you're looking for something to do tonight, I'd encourage you to go out there and just encourage them. And so Reach Church will be praying for you. Also wanted to welcome the venue service meeting right down the hall and all those that are joining us online. Also, don't forget Operation Christmas Child. Don't forget to bring back those boxes. Some of you took them. you got to bring them back, all right? So bring those back. Hopefully, they'll be filled. And uh, you bring them back here. We're already making great progress towards our goal. Uh, but just want to encourage you, if you have not yet picked up a box and you would like to participate, uh, make sure you go out there and pick one of those up this afternoon. Well, this, this morning, Revelation 5, last week we looked at the holiness of God, the glory of God. Today we see the worthiness of Christ. And this is one of those chapters in God's word that is so glorious is so wonderful that, quite frankly, it's intimidating to preach because you can mess it up so easily. It really just demands to be read. In fact, I would encourage you, there are certain chapters of God's Word that are just worth memorizing. All of God's word is really worth memorizing. But if you want a passage that ushers you into the presence of Christ, you will find no better chapter than Revelation chapter 5. It shows us the glory of who Christ is. It shows us what God has done in Christ. It shows us what God is doing in Christ. And it shows us what God will do through Christ. That the key that unlocks all the purposes and all the promises of God is that lion of the tribe of Judah who became the lamb of God that he might die for our sins and purchase for God with his blood a people from every tribe and nation and people and tongue. So with that in mind, let's read it. it. It just needs to be read all together And then we'll do our best to look into it more closely. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. And then I began to weep greatly. Because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. One of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will Rain upon the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on, on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. 
And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Father, I pray for these brief moments that lie ahead of us. You would help us, God, to lay aside any distraction that might hinder us from seeing the glory of Christ. That we would see the worthiness of this one who is in perfect keeping with your divine plan. The one who has brought about redemption through his shed blood. And the one who will return and make things right. Lord, I pray that we would look to him. And I pray if there's anybody here today that doesn't know the salvation of Jesus. I pray that they see the beauty of this Lamb of God who died in their place to provide for them a way of salvation. I pray that they would look to him, believe on him, and know the salvation of Christ today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The first thing that we see right away in verse 1 is that John, as he's looking at the glory of God, as we looked at in chapter 4, he notices something that he must not have seen kind of as, at his first glance. He notices a book, a book in the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. And this book, we know this according to Ezekiel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 12, and in fact, we see it revealed as we will study the rest of this book that that book is the account of God's plan in history. It's the fulfillment of all of God's purposes and plans in history. It includes the judgment of the world that has rejected Christ, the the vindication of the righteous who have trusted in Christ, and the, the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. And we're told two things about this book. We're told, number one, that it's a book that is written inside and on the back which was unusual for a scroll of that day to be written on the front and the back of each page. But the meaning is pretty clear that it is a complete account of the fulfillment of God's plan. That when it it comes to God's plan and the completion of his purposes, there's nothing omitted. There's no loose ends that need to be tied up. God has thought of everything, and his completion to history is perfect and good, and it records every, every detail. It's written on front of the back, and then it says it's sealed up seven times, meaning that it's not just sealed up, but it's sealed up perfectly. So here is this book that kind of grabs his attention, the completion of God's purposes on earth. And then he hears a voice. He sees an angel, verse 2. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And it says there's no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. So this angel is crying out, who's worthy? Who's worthy to, to take this book, to open the seals, and to bring about the completion of all of God's purposes in history? Who's worthy? And it can't just be anybody. I mean, we just saw the glory of God in chapter 4. Not just anybody waltzes into the presence of God and takes the book from his hands. And so the call goes out into all the earth, who is worthy? And there's only silence. There's no one in heaven, meaning there's no, no angelic power. No angel is worthy No angel is able to enter into the presence of God and take the book and bring about the completion of all of God's purposes. And no one on earth, meaning none of us, no human, no mere human, all of us have been infected by the sin of Adam and Eve. Even on our best day, our righteous acts are like filthy rags in the presence of a holy God. None of us dare to walk into the presence of God and take that book. We're not worthy And no one under the earth, it says, meaning no demonic power is able to go into the presence of God and take that book. And so the call goes out and there's only silence. And you see the response of John in verse 4. John weeps. And then I began to weep greatly. Because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. He began to weep greatly. 
In other words, he's not just disappointed, he's grieving. All the purposes and promises of God are contained in the opening of that book, putting evil where it belongs, Christ's final return and reign, the establishment of his perfect kingdom here on earth. If someone is not found worthy to open the book, all those hopes and promises are nothing more than a dream. If no one's worthy to take that book and break those seals, then evil wins. If no one is able, if no one's worthy to take that book and break its seals, then this earth, Lenexa, Kansas, is as good as it gets. And you and I are left in despair with no hope. Just enslaved to sin. With no hope of salvation and the fulfillment of God's purposes. Unless God's book is opened and the scrolls are opened and the seals broken, all of God's purposes and plans remain a divine tourist attraction. When you think about it, Christ saves us fully. He has saved us past tense, meaning that through faith in Jesus Christ, we've been judiciously made right in the sight of God. We also know that in Christ we are being saved, right? The Holy Spirit of God is working salvation in us. We're being conformed more and more every day into the image of Christ. But we also trust and hope, what? That one day we will be fully and finally saved. We're waiting on that day when Christ will return and he'll transform the body of our humble estate into conformity with the body of his glory. We long for that day when God will bring about his the the completion of his perfect purposes. So here is John with no one worthy, in despair and weeping. And look at verse five. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So here he is in despair. No one's able to take the book and break its seals. And one of the elders, one of the church comes to John and says, stop crying. There is somebody who is worthy. And he describes him in at least three ways. He says, first of all, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now that that title should be very familiar to us, having just completed our study in Genesis. You remember in Genesis 49, Jacob is pronouncing blessings upon his sons. And the question is, who will be the one? Which of these brothers, which of these sons will carry forth the line that will bring forth the Messiah? And so they're longing. You'll remember uh, Jacob passes over uh, Reuben and and, and Simeon and Levi. And who does he come to? Comes to Judah. And you remember what he says about Judah? The scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. That it would be through Judah, the the lion of the tribe of Judah, would be the, the lineage through which the Messiah would come. And here the elder says there's a lion of the tribe of Judah. The Messiah has come. Not only is he the lion of the tribe of Judah, it says here that he's the root of David. This is significant. You remember God also made a promise with David that one of your descendants will sit on the throne forever, eternally. In fact, you'll remember when Gabriel appeared to Mary to announce the birth of Christ, he said to Mary, you're going to give birth to a son and he'll be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. And so here he is, the lion of the the tribe of Judah, the root of David, So John is interrupted in his weeping. He's told someone who is worthy has come. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And you can imagine as John begins to think about this in his mind and as he begins to look, he's probably looking for some great warrior king. And as he looks, what does he see? He sees a lamb standing as if slain. And you know what I think? I think as soon as John saw that lamb, it dawned on him. It dawned on him that the the worthiness that is required is the thing that the people of God have been looking for since the 
The promise was made to Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis 3.15. You remember there when man sinned, God made a promise. He would send somebody. But then what did God do? He clothed the man and the woman in what? In the skins of an animal. He clothed the, the shame of their sin in the skins of animals. In order to have the skins of animals, what has to happen? An animal has to die. And what was the lesson there that Adam and Eve learned? You've sinned. And sin must be punished. And someone has to die. In fact, as we study Genesis later, you'll remember Abraham. And Abraham took the young man, this young teenage boy, Isaac, and he took him up on that mountain, Mount Moriah. And there he is. And, and you remember the question, the question that's asked throughout the entire Old Testament as Isaac looks to his father and says, where's the lamb? And that's the question of the entire Old Testament. Where's the lamb? Every Passover, they would take a lamb. They would pronounce the sins of the people upon that lamb. And it was a reminder to them of their longing and looking for a Messiah who would come and sacrificially give his life for the people. In fact, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53 talked about the suffering servant who would be led like a lamb to slaughter. So all the hopes of the Old Testament are looking for a lamb. Yes, they were looking for the lion of the tribe of Judah. They were looking for the root of David. But most importantly, they were looking for a sacrificial lamb who would come and die for their sins and provide ultimate salvation and freedom through faith in him. And you remember it was John the Baptist as he saw Jesus coming. And what did he say? Behold the lamb of God. Here he is. We've been bringing our lambs for a long time. But now God has sent his lamb. Folks, this is amazing when you think about the salvation that God has provided in Christ. That he is God. Jesus left the glory of heaven. We talk about it often in Philippians 2. That although he exists in the form of God. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he made himself nothing. He came. He's God. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of David. He is the rightful king. And one day every knee will bow. But in order for him to be qualified. To take the book and break the seals. He has to go to Calvary. And lay down his life as a sacrificial lamb. So that he might purchase us and our freedom from slavery and sin. What a wonderful Savior we have in Christ Jesus who had every right to remain in glory and just say, I am the King, but knew he couldn't do that and provide our salvation, so he came as the Lamb of God. But also as a reminder that when we were looking for a savior of the world, they have to meet some very specific qualifications, don't they? When you talk about the one who's worthy to take that book and bring about the completion of God's purposes and plans, they gotta fit a lot of qualifications. The way I like to say it is the Old Testament creates a door frame through which only Christ can enter. The fact of the matter is there was only one who was worthy to take that scroll and to break its seals, and it's Jesus Christ. And notice, too, as you look at this, notice where he's standing where is Christ standing? He's standing uh, between the throne of God that we looked at last week with the four living creatures. You remember the holiness of God and that sea of crystal and glass and, and the four living creatures. But he's standing between the glory of God and what? And the elders. I mean the church. Is that not a good picture of who Christ is? Standing between the glory of God that would consume us as sinners. An entrance into his kingdom is one man, Jesus Christ, the mediator, who reconciles God and man through his sacrificial death on the cross. What a powerful picture of the mediator, Christ, who comes, who is worthy. He says he has horns, representation of his power. He has eyes, a representation of his divine knowledge. And he sends out the seven, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Holy Spirit of God, there's no place where he does not reign. And in verse 7 it says he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sit on the throne. It, if you were creating a movie, this would be the climactic scene. You see the picture here where John sees the book. It's the completion, the fulfillment of all God's purposes and plans. No one's worthy. None of us can do it. No angelic being, no demonic power. 
But then, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the Lamb of God comes and he takes that book from the hand of the Father. As I, as I was studying this, I couldn't help but think of a really good depiction of this in the, in the Old Testament. Is Psalm chapter 2. I reference it a lot. It's one of my favorite psalms. It's just a truly messianic psalm. It's not about King David. It's about Jesus. And it says, you'll remember that why do the nations rage and the peoples devise things, vain things? The kings of the earth take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed. And that anointed is Mashiach, it's Messiah, meaning the world doesn't like God and it doesn't want Christ. Is that not a good depiction of the world? We don't want God, we don't want Jesus, we don't want anybody telling us what to do. We want to do whatever we want to do. You know, the natural inclination of man is not to look to God for salvation. They will look to everything else besides God. They'll look to education. Every four years, they'll look to politics. They'll look to philosophy first. They'll look to science They'll do anything but look to God. They say, we don't want God, and we don't want his Messiah. We don't want him telling us what to do. Let us tear his fetters apart, and let us cast away his cords from us. And you know how concerned God is? Do you know what it says next? He who sits in the heavens laughs. That's funny. That you think you can defy me. The only places you see where God is laughing in Scripture when it's in reference to man rejecting him thinking that they can do whatever they want and get away with it. And then he says that he'll speak to them in his anger and he'll terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king. I've predetermined the one means of salvation. I've predetermined who the king is. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and the sacrificial lamb who dies. He's the king. There's no suggestion box in heaven. You don't get to pick and choose your way to God. He says, this is it. I've installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And then Jesus, the Christ, speaks. He says, surely I'll tell of the decree of my Lord, for he said to me, today I have begotten you. You are my son. That's a coronation uh, language there for a king who would bestow the kingdom upon his son. And he would say to him, you're the rightful heir. You're the one. This is not being taken by coup or tyranny or rebellion. You're the rightful son. He said, God looked at me and said, you're my son. Does God say that elsewhere in Scripture? Two other times, the transfiguration and also the baptism. You're my beloved son. You're it. Surely I'll tell the decree of my Lord. He said to me, today you're my son. Today I've begotten you. And then you know what he says? He says, ask of me. Ask of me and I'll surely give you the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession and you shall rule them with a rod of iron and you shall shatter them like earthenware. Jesus says, this is what God said to me. God said to me at the moment of your asking, you ask and the nations are yours and you will break them like a rod of iron you'll shatter them like earthenware, meaning you will bring judgment and you will establish your reign. Is there a moment when that ask of me occurs? I believe it's right here in Revelation 5. When Christ takes that book, God says when and Jesus says now. And he takes the book. And the righteous are vindicated through faith in Christ. And the judgment of God falls upon a world that has rejected him. It's why that psalm that says in the latter portion of the Take warning, O judges of the earth. All you guys who think you're really powerful and you can get away from God, take warning. Show discernment. Lest he become angry and you perish in the way. At some point, God is going to hear the word of Christ say, now and his judgment will come. And by the way, what is it that's hindering Christ from just taking that book? What is is the one thing that keeps Christ from saying now and God bringing about his judgment? Because don't we long for that? Are there moments in this world where we say, God, I'm sick of this evil. I'm sick of evil winning. It looks like you're not noticing. When are you going to vindicate the righteous? When are you going to judge the wicked? We're ready. When is it going to, why does God let, why does God wait? Soul. 
2 Peter 3. Don't count slowness as some count slowness. But God is patient, desiring that none should perish. So that every moment today, there are evil and wicked things occurring in this world. But at the same time, what else is happening? God is drawing in his people. Can I just tell you the reason that I believe Christ might be waiting to say now is he's waiting on you to trust him. And so right here we see the fulfillment of this as Christ takes the book, takes the scroll from the right hand of God and look at what happens. Look at verses 8 through 10. Verses 8 through 10. Find my place here. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God and they will reign upon the earth. What a powerful picture here. You've got the four living creatures and the 24 elders representing the church and now they're in heaven and they see Christ take the book and they begin to worship. And what do they say? You are worthy. You're worthy, why? Because you have purchased for God with your blood a people. What a powerful picture that you and I, prior to faith in Christ, were enslaved to sin. And you and I had to be redeemed. You and I had to be purchased. And the price that was demanded was the blood of God. And Christ came. He became a man so that he could die and die in your place to purchase your redemption. Yeah, you know, every time I see that purchased, I think of that picture of the, uh, the man who is walking along and he sees a slave on the blocks to be sold. And he looks at that man and he has compassion upon him and he says, I want to purchase his freedom. And so he inquires as, as to the price that's demanded, and he quickly realizes it will take everything that he has. But out of his love for this man, he takes all that he has, and he gladly lays it down, and he purchases his freedom, and he takes the keys, and he unlocks the shackles, and he says to this man, you are free to go wherever you desire. And you know what the response of that slave is? He falls on his feet. And he says, I will follow you for the rest of my life. Boy, is that not a good picture of you and I as believers in Jesus Christ, enslaved to sin with no hope of salvation, only destruction and death. God saw us in our humble position, in our sinfulness, and he gave his son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins to purchase you, to redeem you, so that you could be freed from the slavery of sin. Not free to do whatever you want to do, but free now to serve God, to know the lordship of Christ, for his kingdom to reign in our hearts, and to know the joy of walking in fellowship and submission to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We've been purchased with the precious blood of Christ, as Peter says, not with the silver or gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb, unblemished, the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And he's purchased what? He's purchased men. What does it say here? Men from from every uh, tribe and tongue and people and nation. What a powerful picture of the worship of heaven. That in Jesus Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. That the word of God goes out in the midst of a fallen world and he says, come to me. And providentially through the work of the Spirit and the word of God, you have these people like the animals coming to the ark before the flood. They just kind of migrate to the salvation of Jesus Christ. And he draws in people from Africa and Australia and Russia and Lenexa and maybe a couple from Lawrence. But he brings them in too. (laughs) And all of us, we worship around the throne of Christ. It's, you know, we're getting ready to have Thanksgiving dinner. At Thanksgiving, you don't divide your family up according to their salary or their education, do you? Well, boy, you don't have enough to get. There's another table over here for you. No, we're all family, right? Even the rotten ones. And what do we do? We say, get around the table. Because we're all one. That's the church. 
And what we demonstrate in here is a glimpse of what we will do eternally in heaven. That's why one of my favorite things on a mission trip, you know my favorite moment on a mission trip. It is worshiping with other believers in another nation who don't, don't use my language. And I don't have to know the language to know the heart of the individuals that are in the room. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, all worshiping one king, King Jesus, who purchased us with his blood. And in those moments, I always feel like I get a little taste of heaven. What a powerful picture here. He has purchased us with his blood. And we're a kingdom. Once you were not a people. Now you're the kingdom of God. And a kingdom of priests. The Holy Spirit of God residing within us and giving us the ability to what? To go out and tell a lost world about the good news of Jesus Christ. And then you see on, look in verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands upon thousands. This is the host. He is the, he's the Lord of hosts. And so all of the angelic realm begins to sing. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then it moves on, not just the angelic realm, but now all of creation, in verse 13, every created thing which is in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. The way I picture this, it's kind of like the, uh, I told Pastor Bill, I don't know music too much, but I know at certain points he brings the altos in, and then you bring the tenors in, and then the, and then the bass line, right? That's the way I see this heavenly choir of the church with the four living creatures, and then the angelic realm joins in the chorus. And then finally, all of creation begins to sing. And what is the focal point of all of it? It's Jesus. Boy, if there's one thing that you see in this passage that even my sorry preaching can't mess up is that Jesus is the only one who is worthy of all of our worship. Christ alone. There's two places where Christ demands ultimate supremacy. In heaven and in our hearts. When we see who Christ is and what he's done, we give all of our lives back to him. And only in Christ does history, internationally, nationally, personally, history has no meaning apart from Christ. The great philosophers, the great historians cannot tell you the end goal of history. They can't tell you where it's headed. Only in Scripture and through Jesus Christ do we find out where history is headed. That's the beauty of faith in Christ and having the knowledge of God's word, that we know in Christ Jesus what God has done. Do you know this today? If you don't know Christ, you hope, I hope you know it today, that before the foundation of the world, God already had a divine and glorious plan, knowing that you would sin, knowing the sinfulness of your heart, knowing how you'd wander and go away from him and rebel against him. He had already decided a perfect plan to send his son, Jesus Christ, who would be the lion of the tribe of Judah, he'd be the root of David, and he'd be the perfect lamb of God who would die in your place for your sins that was his glorious plan that's what God has done it also tells us what God is doing right now we are between his death and resurrection and his ultimate return and what is God doing today Acts 17 31 having overlooked the times of ignorance God is now declaring to all men to repent You know what God is doing today? His word is going forth into this world to lost men and women, and he's saying to them, repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. Why? Because in Acts 17, 31, it says, because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world through a man. We know what God has done. We know what God is doing. We know what God will do, don't we? 
that one day Christ will say, now the Lord will descend, the dead in Christ will rise first, those of us who are alive will be caught up together with him in the clouds and we'll meet the Lord in the air in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will raise, we will be changed. This perishable will put on the imperishable and we will be changed and Christ will take the book And worship will go forth. And as we're going to see next week in chapter 6, judgment will fall. Here's the question today for every one of us. Knowing what he has done, knowing what he is doing, knowing what he will do, are you ready? If Christ came today, would you be ready? No matter where you're at, whether you know him, or you don't, the encouragement today is turn your eyes on Jesus. You know that song? It's a, it's the song that's been in my mind this week. Helen Limmel wrote it. I had to research it this week. A woman named Helen Limmel uh, wrote this song, or wrote that hymn, and she based it off some writing from a missionary known as Lelias Trotter. Lelias was uh, an incredibly gifted artist. And uh, she had people who were ready to support her in her education. They were willing to invest in her knowing the potential that she had as an artist. But she knew Jesus Christ and she began to feel God's tug in her heart to give her life away in service to him. She began by just going out in the streets of London and seeking to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ, but eventually she felt the call of God to go to Northern Africa. And so she went to Northern Africa, and she wrote about how in Northern Africa she was stripped of all of the distractions of life so that her entire focus was Jesus. And she wrote some incredible things, but there were a couple of paragraphs here, just a few sentences that stuck out to me in what she wrote that really became the basis of the hymn that we know. She says, how do we bring things to a focus in the world of optics? Not by looking at the things to be dropped, but by looking at the one point that is to be brought out. Turn your full soul's vision to Jesus and look and look at him and a strange dimness will come over all that is apart from him and the divine attraction by which God's saints are made even in this 20th century will lay hold of you for he is worthy to have all there is to be had in the heart that he has died to win. We know the words of that song, O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. You ever feel like that today? There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Father, we come before you this morning just overwhelmed with gratitude at the wonder of this glorious plan that you had, knowing all of our sin, past, present, and future, knowing how we would reject you and rebel. You had already devised this glorious plan to send your son Jesus so you could draw us back to yourself. Scripture tells us who he is. All of your word points to this one man, Jesus Christ, who alone is worthy to complete your purposes. And only in him is salvation and redemption found. Lord, I pray this morning, if there's somebody here that's enslaved to sin... They're so sick of the sin of this world that has beaten them down and broken them in so many ways. 
Maybe they're tired of trying to earn their salvation to purchase their own redemption. God, I pray this morning that they would turn their eyes upon Jesus. He has done all the work. All that is left to be done is for them to turn to him, repent of their sins, and trust in Christ. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I pray this morning, Lord, they'd see the depth of their sin and the beauty of Christ who came for them, and they would trust him with all their heart. Lord, I pray for those of us who do know you. I pray that in a world of so many distractions, that Christ Jesus would be the focus of all of our life and our desire as those who have been freed from the bondage of sin would be to tell other people about how they could know that freedom as well. That we would be compelled by your love and your grace to tell others so that when that day comes, they'll know your salvation and not your judgment. Lord, we love you and we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning as we give you an opportunity to respond in whatever way God might be leading in your heart. Maybe you have questions about salvation, how you can know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. We'll have pastors here at the front. They would love to speak with you, love to talk with you about how you can know Christ. Maybe this morning you'd like to unite with our church family and become a, a member of Lenexa Baptist Church. If you'd like to do that, we want to encourage you to come now. Come talk to one of these pastors and We'd love to rejoice with you in that decision. Maybe you just want to pray this morning. Maybe God is working in some other way. I'll encourage you with this as I do each week. You'll never regret obeying Jesus. So you respond as we sing.